we are removing the human from designing the specific behaviors. The human doesn't need to design the particular, you know, model of the robot, which is used to come up with action. We can use this algorithm and within three hours, it could walk, but we could also have it jump. Can robots run? Well, not easily and usually not without a ton of training. MIT, however, has built a cheetah, which recently broke the record for fastest robot, and perhaps even more interestingly, taught itself how to run. To learn just how it did that and what it means for the future, we're chatting with MIT professor Polkit Agrawal and PhD student Gabriel Margolis. Welcome to Tech First. Uh, thank you, John, for having us. We are excited to be with you. Excellent. Tell me about the robot. What is Cheetah? So, so Cheetah is a robot which was developed by the biomimetics lab at MIT in a hope that at some day we can have robots like the real Cheetah, right? And it has gone through multiple iterations. And, you know, what we have now is a miniature version of the bigger Cheetah. And this is what is called as the mini Cheetah. So think of it as a robotic platform in, with which we can study how we can get to the real cheetah-like locomotion. Tell me about the size and the speed. It's got four legs. What kind of weight are we looking at here? Yeah, so so the robot, it's, it's nine kilograms, uh, so around 20 pounds, and four legs. Each leg actually has three motors in it, so two in the shoulder and one in the knee. And so there are a total of 12 motors on the robot, and it stands about 30 centimeters tall. That's actually really interesting that you say there's three motors per leg, because I'm trying to imagine how many muscles I might have in my leg. And I'm guessing it's <laughs> maybe an order of magnitude more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in some ways, well, it, definitely this robot is, is a very simplified version of what we would find in nature. And uh, right with three degrees of freedom, what we can get is a good range of motion of the foot to be able to like put it in different locations and apply forces in different directions. But uh, a, a whole lot of stuff can happen between the foot and the shoulder uh, that may or may not be captured by this robot, but could, could occur in biological systems. Yeah. So I want to talk about how it taught itself to run, which is super cool, super interesting, and super relevant to future robotic design and delivery. Uh, but uh, first off, how fast does it go? So we can go up to, uh, well, the, the fastest that we've recorded it uh, using the controller we designed is 3.9 meters per second, uh, which to our knowledge is the fastest that anyone has made it go. So uh, yeah, uh, for reference, that's probably like a pretty fast human running speed. Um, I mean, not like Usain Bolt fast sprinting, but a uh, <laughs> typical person, like I would have to, I'd be a little short of breath running, running aside it for sure. Okay, interesting. So we're not quite at cheetah speed here, you know, 70 kilometers an hour or something like that, but, you know, maybe we're approaching 25 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, hour. and of course, one thing to note is that this, this robot stands much shorter than a, a human or cheetah uh, and has much shorter legs, right? So one, one important thing is to consider is adjusting for, for size when we think about the, the speed of these robots. And of course, there have been other legged robots too, which maybe have uh, run faster in the past, but were much larger. Interesting. So you scale up, you scale up your levers, you scale up your speed uh, as well. Well, Polkit, let's get into one of the most interesting things about this. It taught itself how to run. How'd that happen? Yeah, no, great, great question, right? So what we did was, you know, we made up some environments where we thought the cheetah should be able to perform very well. Right. So that means that we set, you know, how the ground should vary, you know, what should be the friction of the ground, so on and so forth. And then an algorithm pretty much, you know, uh, outputs a sequence of commands, which are a sequence of, you know, joint positions. And then we would evaluate if this sequence of actions are good or bad by measuring how fast the cheetah walked. Right. And then whatever actions led to faster motion, we would prioritize them more and more. So what's essentially happening is trial and error learning and things which are winning, you know, get incentivized more and the agent tries them more and more, right? So, so that, that's pretty much at a high level what's happening. So that's super interesting. 
I'm wondering if it's more complex than that, or if you think you'll make it more complex than that in the be in, in, as you go, because you basically said, hey, you're rewarded. You, it's a positive when you go faster. Uh, there isn't like a, is there like a safety uh, thing? You know, you're rewarded as you hit fewer things or you're rewarded as you fall down less or something like that? Uh, definitely, right? So I think you raised two very important points. So definitely you're given a negative reward if you fall down. <laughs> Otherwise known as a punishment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you need to punish it for doing bad things. And, you know, you, we also penalize it, right? I mean, don't make an action which consumes too much energy, for example. Right. So, so there are, you know, some things that we want the robot to do and some things we don't want the robot to do. And, you know, the whole art is in, you know, saying the minimal amount of things so that the robot also has the flexibility to, you know, come up with its own behaviors to go fast. Right. I mean, we don't want to trust the human to say exactly how you should move the leg. Yeah. Right. But we still want to put constraints like, OK, don't consume too much energy and still, you know, run fast. That is really interesting because you can imagine tweaking those parameters as you have different applications. You can also imagine a learning system that learns to tweak its own parameters as it, um, you know, looks at a future journey that it has to take. For instance, something I need to get, you know, a hundred miles over there. I have this much energy. I better go at that speed in order to get there. And that's probably slow, but I'll get there. Talk about why it's important that this robot teaches itself and what that will do in the future? Again, an excellent question, right? So what we are really looking for is a scalable way to construct robotic systems, right? If I said, hey, John, here is a robot and I wanted to make it walk, but come back after a year, right? And then it's like, okay, now it needs, you know, it also has a hand and it needs to open doors. Give me another year or a couple of years, right? Now you can kind of add up the number of years it would be required before we have a robot in the house, right? Or to develop, you know, a particular application where the need is like, oh, we need this robot in a day or, you know, you know, some disaster happens, right? And, and it's a specific kind of manipulation required. Now, now, traditionally, the approaches that people have been using require you to study the actual system and, you know, manually design models and which are used for doing control, right? And this process is good, it's well established, but it's not very scalable. It has this human in the loop, right? What we are trying to do is to, you know, find the right balance of human in the loop so that we can train these systems quickly, mm -hmm. right? So we are still building a simulation environment, right? But we are removing the human from designing the specific behaviors the human doesn't need to design the particular, you know, model of the robot which is used to come up with action, right? So essentially, you know, we can use this algorithm and within, you know, three hours come up with, you know, it to walk, but we could also have it jump. But we have also other places where you use similar frameworks to say, have a hand manipulate an object, right? So I could, you know, pick up an object and it can, you know, start reorienting like this. Right with a very with with, a, with the same framework, right? So essentially, I think the reason we are doing this is so we can make robot learning be scalable, so we can go to applications faster. And so that's part of what you talked about uh, before. You said uh, accelerating a hundred days of learning into three hours. That's a massive it is speed up factor. I mean, that's huge, right? Yes. So, so maybe I will try to, you know, put that in context, right? So, so I think when we are saying, you know, 100 days to three hours, I think this is because in simulation, things can go much faster than real time, right? Mm -hmm. And over here, we are actually leveraging advances from NVIDIA and, you know, other companies which have built good simulators, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when we say about scalability, I think the scalability we are talking about is amount of human time required to engineer a behavior, right? So, so, so I think there are two different aspects, yes. right? So, so, so the, the cost is if I remove a human designer from designing behaviors, I need to pay a cost. And that cost is we are doing trial and error learning, but then it requires a lot more data, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you were to do this in the real world, 
this would be very expensive because it would require 100 days of real world experience. And if the robot falls down, that's not very good, <laughs> right? So what simulator offers us is kind of a safe playground where it's okay for the robot to fall down and, you know, go bad, but also the simulator can run much faster than real time, right? That so, makes so a ton of sense. Yeah, absolutely. I totally get that. And, you know, after 100 days of real world testing and having the robot fall down here and fall downstairs there, you probably wouldn't have a robot left uh, to do <laughs> more training and testing with, which brings up an interesting point. What perceptual systems have you built into Cheetah? How does it perceive the world around it, where the ground is, what the environment it's in, how not to run into things, and how to maybe act differently depending on what it sees on the ground or feels on the ground? You want to take this one, Gabe? Uh, yeah, so actually right now, or in the system that we deployed, uh, there are no cameras whatsoever. Um, so actually, all, all of the behaviors that uh, we've shown have been achieved essentially blindly. So what the what the mini cheetah, what the robot is doing is it's feeling the environment uh, through. Uh, it doesn't even have it doesn't have touch sensors either in its feet, but it's just feeling the environment through uh, the motion of its joints. So for for example, uh, when you walk, if you think about how you walk over uh, you know uh, an ordinary indoor floor versus how you might walk uh, across an icy pond. If you tried to walk the same way, you might experience a very different feeling and, and find yourself in a very different uh, position <laughs> than uh, on these two different surfaces. So even if you had your eyes closed, you would probably be able to tell the difference between uh, the two surfaces that you were crossing as you cross them. And so that's actually all of this robot is, is doing right now to adapt to different terrains is it's feeling what happens to its own uh, body over time. Um, so in the future, we're definitely interested in uh, maybe adding more sensors, but all of these behaviors that we've shown were actually achieved without them. That's amazing. Um, it kind of reminds me of a long time ago. I went camping early spring and we had to ford across a cold river and I lost feeling in my feet. <laughs> I had to just shove my foot down to feel, was there a rock? What, could I take another step, move forward? So it's just feeling where its own limbs are, basically. I understand there's probably extra, um, well, there's computational cost. There's sort of world modeling cost and energy cost by building in more perceptions over time. Um, but um, I'm guessing you'll do that and make something that could do more sophisticated things. It's amazing that you've done it without any of that so far. Yeah, yeah. So there are certainly some, some advantages to using vision, but uh, there are a lot of drawbacks too. One is that it can be a lot slower to simulate, actually. So you might not be able to get this, this massive speed up in the same way using just the regular, like trying to simulate what, what would the robot see as it crosses different terrains. Um, another is actually that there's some uh, aspect of the robot that it can't see. For example, its own mass. Uh, like if I put a payload on the robot's back, um, maybe the camera isn't pointed uh, in, a, in a place where it's going to be able to see that, but it will be able to feel it through its joints. Uh, so I do think this is a really powerful framework of, uh, in particular, adapting to what the robot feels. I'm not sure it's going to work for um, making Tesla self-driving. <laughs> might cost a lot <laughs> and kill a few uh, people on the streets, but I, I totally get it. Uh, let's talk about... Go ahead. Yeah, there's an also an interesting panel to what you mentioned, right? With like Tesla and self-driving and, you know, the role of vision over here, right? So you, you don't want to use vision to teach a car how to move left or right, right? That, that you can still learn. What you want to use vision is to say when I should move left and when I should move right, right? So essentially you want this right kind of modularity to build a scalable system, right? So, so what our cheetah is doing is, you know, it, it can walk and it can run. Now what it needs to learn is when, if I have to go somewhere, I should avoid ice or I should, you know, maybe jump over something or crouch under something, right? So, so this design choices is not, you know, it, it also has that element of putting modularity in the right way. I love that. I love that because that's very human. That's very uh, kind of biological. We have different systems. Like uh, there's a part of my brain that says, I want to go to 
McDonald's. <laughs> That's not the part of brain that says, okay, start moving, lean forward, lift a leg, get the arms going, all that stuff. That happens almost autonomically, right? I mean, just it, we don't even think about it. Subconscious is happening there, right? So yeah. that makes a ton of sense. You've got modularity and you can add different components based on need um, and, and what you've got available. So... <laughs> This has been, this is a pretty fast robot. Um, and sometimes I'm wondering what you, you would do if you see this running to you at high speed in dark alley after midnight. <laughs> but um, how fast can you, do you think you can get? So I think, you know, the speed is proportional to how much power we're going to put in, right? So if we increase the motors, you know, if we increase the size of the robot, of course, you know, it can go faster and faster. Right. So I think it is, you know, pretty application driven. If you said, well, you know, I want a robot which goes as fast as Usain Bolt, you know, I'm sure one can build such a robot. Right. In fact, you know, Boston Dynamics had a demonstration, you know, way back in 2012 that they had a robot going as fast as Usain Bolt. Mm -hmm. But the difference was that this robot was on a treadmill. It was externally powered. Right. And it had a support system. Too. Yes. Right. And, and what we were trying for is, yes, we want to be fast, but we also want to be on natural terrain, right, mm -hmm. as a real cheetah is. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, John, to answer your question, it depends on what approach is you will hear me. And, you know, we'll make it as fast as you want it. <laughs> <laughs> always faster, always faster. But that brings up a, that's a great segue, actually. It brings up a good question, which is the power problem, right? When <laughs> we saw those robots from Boston Dynamics, you know, there's an external power source. And that, that's a big deal, right? Because power is hard to build in uh, efficiently for a decent amount of time. What, how do you solve that? How do we solve, you know, being able to give an autonomous robot at least hours of power yeah again an excellent question right i, I think this is where you know what you'll find is non-linear movement in the research so some people might come in and say hey what about a solar powered skin on the robot right? <laughs> <laughs> it only so, has moved very slowly <laughs> right I, I think there are things you can do in terms of you know, batteries, right? And where we are seeing a lot of movement happening in the space. Then there are things that we can do in terms of the control design, right? I mean, right now I said, you know, we are minimizing energy, but, you know, we could do it much better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then there are things in the hardware design, for example, right? Like if you look at this robot, it has this, you know, feet, which is like a sphere, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't really have an ankle to it, right? Right. So imagine that if you had to walk, but without an ankle or run without an ankle, it would incredibly be hard, right? And if you have an ankle, which is compliant, you could generate energy by pressing into the ankle, mm -hmm. right? And then leveraging, you know, that. So, so I think that you know, this is a multi-dimensional problem, you know, that we will solve by, you know, better ways of harvesting energy, for example, solar energy, you know, better batteries, which are going to come in, you know, just better mechanical design, right? Maybe if we build, you know, like lighter robots, right? Instead yeah. of using what materials we are using, right? And so, yeah, so, so I think it's going to be a convergence of many things. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that there's some robots, I believe some military ones that are using like small internal combustion engines as well, because gas is a pretty efficient, uh, fuel is a pretty efficient um, collector of energy um, in, in a small amount of space. So that, that makes some sense. Uh, super interesting. Also an ankle, I think would um, make your robot last longer because <laughs> <there's, laughs> it's a cushioning factor as well, right? So uh, that would make a lot of sense. Let's talk about um, where this will be useful. So we've talked about speed, that's cool. We've talked about learning, that's essential if you want robots to uh, enter and be somewhat adaptable. You know, it's not like a single purpose. I, you know, stamp out that part. or <laughs> I weld that thing, right? If you want an adaptable uh, robot, it needs to learn. Mm -hmm. Where will this be useful? Where do you see it going? You want to take this game? Yeah. So I guess uh, the so specifically on the the subject of legged robots, I think that what's what's potentially useful about them is that they can uh, go a lot of places that that wheeled robots can't. And of course, we use wheeled robots 
all the time. Uh, we may not always think of them as wheeled robots, but you know, they're cars out on the roads and uh, they perform all sorts of useful uh, tasks for us, such as delivering goods, uh, like emergency rescue and response, um, and uh, you know, taking us places, transportation. So, uh, but, but they're constrained to operating on these services that are specifically designed for wheeled robots. They can't come into human environments and interact with us uh, in our in our homes and our offices and our factories um, as easily. So uh, really, that's uh, all, all of those domains are are places where where legs can produce benefit. We can have you know emergency response uh, vehicles that actually come into a home and and save someone. Uh, we can have uh, delivery services that bring something you know up your stairs uh, onto your porch or even into your house. And I think that this expansion of robot mobility will be will be really cool for all of these applications. I would also say that the the learning based techniques that are behind uh, the control of these legged robots can then be extended uh, to robots with other form factors and other interesting functionality. Uh, in particular, robots that can uh, use hands and fingers to manipulate the world. It's actually in some ways a similar control problem of course, with other details involved. Um, but uh, we're, we're optimistic that maybe some of these these learning techniques that are useful in leg robots can also be useful over there, and we can build robots that can actually uh, interact with, with objects in their environment and perform tasks that way as well. Super cool. I love it. I mean, like, also, you, you mentioned coming into the house last mile for delivery. Those make tons of sense. Even search and rescue, uh, going in the forest, on the mountain, somewhere, something like that, right? That you know, uh, rescue on Everest, right? You don't want to send a human up there because they're in the death zone. Maybe you can send a robot at some point. Who knows? Uh, so many applications there. I wanted to ask you to follow up, um, Gabriel, on that just briefly because you mentioned cars in the context of robots. How do you define robots? So it's it's difficult to define a robot. Um, one definition that I like is that a robot is a mechanical system that doesn't work yet. Um, or <laughs> that, that, that's and, a, <laughs> I don't like that one. Maybe that's too, maybe that's too broad. Um, but but I, I think that uh, our, our definition of autonomy, uh, in some ways, it, it keeps shifting and, and it's not well defined. That's just my my opinion because we have a lot of machines that can do a lot of interesting things autonomously for us. Um, for example, we have uh, you know washing machines uh, in our mm -hmm. homes that will wash our dishes mm -hmm. or our clothes and automate a lot of things that used to take a lot of like human manual labor. Um, but we don't typically think of those as robots. Maybe maybe some people do, but. Typically, robotics researchers are not thinking anymore about um, dishwashers because it's sort of a solved problem. Um, mm -hmm. And we're thinking about what are all of the edge cases that a dishwasher couldn't handle in a Is kitchen, really which of course there are many. Problem, though. <laughs> the big pots don't fit in. Somebody sure. has to rinse them. It has to go in. It has to come out. It has to be placed somewhere. All those problems are not solved. I mean, sure, the actual washing, but I mean, what about it? I'm just, I'm just bugging you. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. But, but I guess to give a more formal definition, I think, I think a robot is like a machine um, that perceives the world uh, using some sort of sensors and then takes action on the world um, using actuators, which uh, I mean, in legged robots, we would think of as just the, the motors of the robot. Mm -hmm. um, for a washing machine, of course, it might be some nozzles and, and things like that. <laughs> um, wow. But, uh, okay. and, and in between the sensors and actuators, uh, there will be some processing that decides, okay, given what I'm seeing in the world, uh, how, how should I operate on it? So that's super interesting. Uh, under that definition, um, my Tesla Model Y uh, is a robot um, because it will drive itself um, under certain conditions. Um, and on others, I will not allow it. <laughs> but So that is interesting. That brings up another question, though, because, um, and Pulkit, I'm going to direct it your way, because you're building some really amazing tech here, um, just in terms of what this robot can do how it acts, but especially the learning capabilities that we need. We need in a lot of different places. Uh, we are in an interesting place as a world. We have a ton of environmental issues. We have potential workforce issues as uh, many populations around the globe are aging. 
as some populations are potentially even decreasing. And just as we want to do apply human uh, ingenuity and creativity to higher order problems, and we want to allow machines to do some things that, you know, we really wouldn't want a human to have to do. They do right now, but it'd be nicer if they don't. How do MIT innovations like this get commercialized? How do they get out in the real world? How do you get this in the hands of companies that are building robots right now and need better ways to train them um, and get them smart and useful in the world? I mean, John, this is an excellent question, right? And, you know, how do we, you know, so what we think of research is a technology demonstration so that people can start imagining what is possible. Right. And then there are, you know, different ways in which we can, you know, take this technology in real hands. Right. I mean, one way is, you know, Gabe decides, you know, he wants to do a startup and, you know, really commercializes this technology. Right. And, I mean, uh, we have had past instances, like, you know, a couple of my students last year, they were working on some robotic systems and now they have their own company. Right. And I, I think it, at MIT, you know, like entrepreneurship is highly encouraged. And that is one avenue, right? Another avenue is, you know, to license, you know, such technology, but licensing and filing patents is a two-way sword, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways, you know, some companies could pick it up, but we are also steaming, you know, open source, mm -hmm. uh, you know, build up, which can happen from our work, right? So, I mean, for example, we have released this work in open source. So if you want to download the code, you know, play around with it, replicate the results, you can do it. Yeah. And the good thing is we're really doing this research on a low cost platform, which, you know, which you could kind of, even if you build your own quadruped, you can deploy our system on it because we don't use any specialized or expensive equipment to do it. So in some ways, our research is very democratic in some ways, right? And then, you know, there's always this third option where some company, you know, comes across our work and they're like, hey, this technology is something that we can incorporate, you know, we give out, we go give talks, you know, MIT has its own, you know, technology office, you know, which helps, you know, take this research and figures out who the right partners are. But from our perspective, you know, what as researchers we try to do is to make it as open source as possible, right? And sometimes, you know, some people may not see the vision and we are able to see the vision and then we, you know, go out, open our own companies. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you both of you. Uh, this has been super interesting. The cheetah is very cool and the speed that you've been able to get it up to is impressive as is the self-learning uh, capabilities that you've given it that are uh, in some sense kind of human-like. Thank you so much for this time. Thanks a lot, John, for having us. Thank you, John.